Oh, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Nancy Moyer? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing by in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the disappearance, then offer my analysis. Nancy Karen Moyer was born in Olympia, Washington, on November 22, 1972. She attended Central Washington University and studied accounting. Nancy met a man named Bill Moyer, and they became romantically involved. After graduation, the couple married. They went on to have two daughters, Amanda and Samantha. Nancy worked as a financial analyst for the Washington State Department of Ecology in Lacey, Washington. In 2007, Nancy and Bill separated. There was no chance of reconciliation. They were definitely apart, but they did not get legally divorced. The separation was described as amicable. The couple shared custody of their two daughters, and neither one of them ever missed a drop-off or a pickup of the children. Nancy lived alone in a house on the 700 block of State Route 507 in Tonino, Washington, this is about 14 miles south of Olympia. It appears as though Nancy became a little bit wild after her separation. She frequently visited bars and had many casual sexual encounters. As part of her custody arrangement with Bill, Nancy had Friday and Saturday evenings free. Apparently, she made the most of this time as far as dating, but she told people that she never brought her lovers to her house. Now moving to the timeline of the disappearance. On March 6, 2009, Nancy left her job at about 5.15 p.m. She regularly carpooled to work and dropped off a co-worker at his home. She did not mention any weekend plans to the co-worker other than spending time at her house. Nancy went to a grocery store and purchased a microwave dinner, cigarettes, and two bottles of wine. According to a receipt found in her house, she checked out at 6.45 p.m. It's not clear what Nancy did next, but she wasn't spotted again until between 9 and 9.30 p.m. when a police officer saw Nancy enter her house carrying a bag. The officer, who was trying to catch speeding motorists, reported that she was alone. Two days later, on Sunday, March 8, Bill arrived at Nancy's house with their two daughters. His intent was to drop his daughters off. When Bill and his daughters approached the house, they noticed that the door was ajar. They entered the house, but could not find Nancy. Bill called a few people who knew Nancy to find out if they had heard from her, but no one had. Bill took his daughters back to his home and reported Nancy missing on March 9. On the same day, Nancy missed work, which was extremely unusual. Here's what the police found during their investigation of Nancy's disappearance. The employees at the store where Nancy stopped on Friday could not remember if she was alone or not. The store did not have surveillance cameras. There was no signs of a struggle in Nancy's house and no signs of forced entry. The television was on. The kitchen light and the light next to Nancy's bed were on. On a coffee table, there was a glass of wine and an empty glass. Only Nancy's fingerprints were found on the glasses. Nancy's purse, checkbook, credit cards, and identification were in the house. Her car keys were hanging up on a hook, as usual. Nancy did not own a cell phone. Nancy's white Honda Civic was parked in her driveway. It does not appear as though Nancy had packed anything or planned to leave. A long brown coat with a fur-type lining was missing. Nancy was known to wear this coat frequently. Nancy's cigarettes and a lighter were found on a chair on her porch. Nancy's utility bill indicated that the heating system had an unusual spike in gas consumption late on Friday. The police thought that this was from the front door being left open. They believe Nancy probably left the house sometime between 11.30 p.m. and midnight. At around midnight, a neighbor heard a hurried female voice and the slamming of car doors. The female voice said something like, let's get going. The neighbor assumed that the voice was Nancy's. When the police looked into Nancy's finances, they noticed that she had not accessed any of her financial accounts after March 6. 
The police were surprised to discover she was carrying over $50,000 in credit card debt. This information conflicted with the accounts that Nancy was cautious and responsible. Nancy's estranged husband, Bill, and the man Nancy dropped off after work were both cleared as potential suspects. The police found two messages from a man on Nancy's home phone. The man only identified himself as Jim. The police initially did not know who this was, but later they discovered his name was Jim Roth. He was Nancy's co-worker and claimed that he was supposed to go on a date with her that weekend. He called her four times and left those two messages that the police found. Jim told the police that he and Nancy had gone on a date before. She had been to his apartment a couple weeks earlier. They attempted to have sex, but Jim was unable to perform. As far as his alibi, Jim said that he was with his sons in his apartment. The police wanted to talk to his sons, but they needed the mother's permission to do that. She told them that her sons told her that Jim was there all night. She did not grant the police permission to talk to her sons. Rather than Jim just concluding his story at this point, just stopping with his alibi, he added some information that the police thought was peculiar. He said that on Saturday, March 7, he went to Nancy's house to look for her. He had never been inside of her house before, but he entered her residence after seeing the door was ajar. He even walked into her bedroom. Jim called out for Nancy, but did not receive a response. The police could not find any of Jim's DNA or fingerprints anywhere in Nancy's house. Years later, in 2012, Jim was interviewed again. He changed his story. He originally said that they tried to have sex on that prior date. In his new story, he said they did have sex. He also changed the day that he was there in her house from Saturday, March 7 to Friday, March 6. Jim Roth died of natural causes about five years later after this re-interview on November 15, 2017. On August 8, 2010, a man named Bernard Howell was pulled over in a delivery truck after he asked someone to help him move a body. The police found a 60-year-old woman dead in his delivery truck. She had been murdered within a mile of Nancy's house. Bernard worked for a company that sold meat door-to-door. -door. Nancy had the same brand of meat in her freezer, and one of her daughters identified Bernard as having been at Nancy's house. Bernard denied having any involvement in Nancy's death. He was convicted of the other homicide and sentenced to over 26 years in prison. On July 9, 2019, a man named Eric Roberts called 911 and implicated himself in the disappearance of Nancy Moyer. He said that he was tired of holding it inside and he knew that Nancy was gone. Eric had been Nancy's coworker and neighbor prior to her disappearance. The police interviewed Eric. First, he said that Nancy attacked him and he killed her in response. Then he gave the police a different story. Eric claimed that he and Nancy were having rough sex at his house when he strangled her with a scarf. He did not mean to kill her. Later, Eric burned the scarf. The police asked Eric where the body was. He walked out to a fire pit in his backyard and stared at it without saying anything. Then he said, quote, I don't really want to incriminate myself any further, but if I was going to get rid of a body on my property, it would be right there, unquote. As he was saying this, he pointed at the fire pit. Eric was arrested on suspicion of second-degree murder. He was interviewed a second time and recanted his confession, saying he did not know why he confessed. The police did not find a body in the area of the fire pit, and Eric was released from custody. At the time making this video, the classification of Nancy's case by the police is a no-body homicide. Now moving to my analysis. As I examine the theories in this case, I'm going to run under the assumption that Nancy left her house in a half-hour window starting at 11.30 p.m. on Friday, March 6, 2009. This seems like a reasonable conclusion based on the evidence available. There are essentially only two theories to evaluate in this case. One, someone murdered Nancy. There are a few potential suspects in this case. Each one represents a version of this theory that I will cover separately. Two, Nancy left of her own free will. Whether it was to bring an end to her own life or to start a new life, she decided to leave of her own volition and no one else was involved. If one theory is not correct, then the other one 
must be. With this in mind, let's evaluate the theory that someone murdered Nancy, starting with the factors supporting this theory. Nancy would not have left her children behind voluntarily. She worked hard to build her career and was a reliable employee. She valued her time with co-workers. She would not have left her front door ajar and left her purse behind. She did not take her vehicle, and a neighbor heard a car door slamming, which suggests that someone else was involved. Nancy did not appear to be prepared for any type of trip and left in a hurry late at night. Nancy was going through a bit of a rambunctious stage, which involved having sex with a number of different men. One of those men could have killed her. She did not have any history of mental illness, including substance use, which could explain her impulsively running away. Moving to the factors that refute this theory, there was no forced entry into Nancy's house. There was no sign of a struggle. Based on what a neighbor heard, Nancy appears to have left with somebody voluntarily. She was probably wearing her coat. Most kidnappers would not have been concerned about permitting a victim to get a coat. Nancy was secretly carrying a lot of debt. Perhaps she ran off to start a new life to avoid paying it. Now looking at a few versions of this homicide theory. Version number one is that Eric Roberts was responsible. Looking at the evidence that supports this theory, clearly his confession makes him look guilty, and he was connected to Nancy in many ways. He was her neighbor, co-worker, and his nephew dated Nancy at one point. Eric's former girlfriend implied that he had violent mood swings, drank alcohol, and sometimes choked her during sex. Not long after Nancy went missing, Eric built a concrete structure on his property. He told his girlfriend that he was building a man cave or a fort, but she thought this was strange because there were no utilities running to the structure. Moving to the evidence that contradicts the version of the homicide theory where Eric was responsible. If Eric really murdered Nancy, why was he unable to show the police where her body was? Eric recanted his confession and said he did not remember confessing. He claimed that medication he was taking may have affected his memory. No physical evidence connects Eric to Nancy's disappearance. Version number two is that Jim Roth was involved. Looking at the evidence supporting this theory, Jim told the police that he had entered Nancy's house after finding the door ajar. Initially, he said he was there on Saturday. Later, he changed his story to Friday. There's no reason to believe that he was there on Friday. The door would have been shut and locked at that time, and that's before he would have been looking for Nancy anyway. Jim's proclamation that he was in Nancy's house makes it seem like he was trying to explain why his DNA or fingerprints may have been there. As it turns out, the police didn't find any physical evidence connecting Jim to the house, but he didn't know that at the time. Jim was described as extremely anxious when being interviewed by the police, and he was a peculiar individual in general. Jim's alibi is flimsy, he said that he was with his sons, but presumably they would have been sleeping overnight, so he could have left, committed the murder, and returned home without being detected. Moving to the factors contradicting this version of the theory, Jim's alibi may have been flimsy, but he did have an alibi. He did not have a particularly strong motive to kill Nancy. Jim admitted that he failed to perform on a date with Nancy. Maybe he was eager to see her because he wanted to prove that he could perform like he wanted to have another chance to show that he could get his equipment to function properly. The last version of the homicide theory, version number three, is that Bernard Howell was involved. This theory is supported by the fact that Bernard had murdered another woman and probably had contact with Nancy at some point. Working against this theory would be that Bernard came in contact with a lot of people through his job selling meat door to door and probably didn't kill most of them, Murdering people is usually not good for sales. Simply having contact with Nancy doesn't make Bernard her killer. When considering all the evidence in this case, how would I rank the theories and the versions of the theories? I think the theory that Nancy was murdered is much more likely than any theory where she was not. The most likely version of the murder theory, in my opinion, is that someone other than the three potential suspects was the killer. So a perpetrator who has never been identified as a potential suspect. It was almost certainly someone that Nancy had dated or otherwise met in a bar. 
After this version, I would go with Eric Roberts, the man who confessed and recanted, Jim Roth, the man who admitted to being in Nancy's house, and finally Bernard Howell, the door-to-door meat salesman. I don't think it's likely that Bernard did it, because it seems like Nancy went with her killer voluntarily. I doubt that Bernard would have showed up at Nancy's house near midnight and said, Hey, remember me? I'm the guy who sells meat door-to-door. Do you want to take a midnight ride in my vehicle for no apparent reason? We won't be gone that long. You don't even need to close your door or take your purse. Both Eric and Jim knew Nancy, and she might have left with them voluntarily if they pretended there was some type of emergency. But she would not have left voluntarily with Bernard. As far as the theory that Nancy left without anyone else's involvement, I think there is almost no chance that that happened. I agree with the police in this case. Nancy was probably murdered. Now moving to my final thoughts. The case of Nancy Moyer can be summed up in this way. A restless revenue analyst had a rift in her romance in order to recklessly recapture her rowdy reverie. Replete with risky rendezvous, She ran into a regiment of repugnant rascals, repulsive rogues, and raunchy ruffians, including a reclusive neighbor, a ruthless meat representative, and a retiring colleague with romantic roadblocks. Relying on a ruse, a man roped her from her residence, which resulted in her ruin. Those are my thoughts on the case of Nancy Moyer. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.